Hello and welcome to the Dissect and Connect podcast. I'm your host, Mike Wade. This is the podcast where we explore population health issues impacting your community. The Dissect and Connect podcast is a service of Montgomery County Prevention Partners and New River Valley Community Services. Emile Morris is a community outreach specialist with the Women's Resource Center of the New River Valley, where she helps co-facilitate the organization's inclusion council. Emile identifies as non-binary and is fine with she, her, and he, him pronouns. She graduated from Radford University in 2014 with a degree in psychology and a minor in criminal justice. It was during college that Emile transitioned. While Emile's own experience of identity, including sexuality, mental illness, and gender, have changed over time, she credits her longtime partner, Chris, with providing consistent support for the past 11 years. So, Emil, hello, and welcome to the Dissect and Connect podcast. Hi, Mike. I'm happy to be here. Uh, the podcast is fabulous. I've loved every episode I've listened to. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, we are honored to have you on as a guest. I'm going to start off with a question that I've been asking of a lot of our guests recently, the elephant in the room, so to speak, COVID-19. How have you been personally impacted by the pandemic? Oh, gosh. Well, it, it's very, it's been very strange. It's been very stressful. Uh, I've spent a lot of time making masks, you know, trying to keep abreast of the information, how things should be. There's a lot of uncertainty, I think, for everybody. When you want to feel like you're the best informed that you possibly can be about an emergent topic, it's a, it's a hard run. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to say the least. Um, I mentioned in your bio that you are a community outreach specialist with the Women's Resource Center. I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about your role with the agency. Yeah, absolutely. Our whole community outreach team works really, really hard to bring education and presentations to the New River Valley. And we're sort of split between uh, what our Peace Line team does, which is our school program, uh, they bring information about healthy relationships, healthy boundaries, things like that to school kids, which is a really awesome program that not everywhere is lucky enough to have. Right. I know as a kid, I certainly did not yeah. get that. And I think most folks would really benefit from it because even if you're never victimized by domestic or sexual violence, it can help you navigate relationships that are healthy as well. So I'm really happy we have that. And then Stephanie and I, do a lot of the community and college level presentations. Um, we do some presentations to churches and things like that, professional environments, doctors, whoever will take us, basically. Yeah. Um, we talk to coaches, we talk to clubs, and my sort of special niche in that department is to address special populations, which mean people have been historically underserved in whatever way. Uh, and part of that role, I mentioned in the intro that you uh, co-facilitate the Inclusion Council at the WRC. Can you talk a little bit more about that group and its purpose? Oh, yes. So it was founded as the LGBTQ plus task force, which okay. is a very um, pointy name, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was founded for an awesome reason, which is the folks at the WRC realized, I mean, even as a place called the Women's Resource Center and I mean, obviously, the impact of domestic and sexual violence on women can't be understated. Right. They bear a huge brunt of that burden. But then that means that we end up with this certain idea of what domestic and sexual violence look like. Who are the perpetrators? Who are the victims? How do we best serve them? So the WRC came together and said, we need to figure out exactly where our gaps are for people who are lesbian and gay, transgender, bisexual, you know, anything else, anything in that plus or that Q. You know, how do we serve them the best? And it's become sort of an uh, interdisciplinary, I think is the word, council, I guess, of everybody, professionals. We have like some legal people. We have some forensic nurses. We have some mental health folks that always come. And we talk about how do we best serve our LGBT community members here in Appalachia, here in the New River Valley? How do we meet those unique challenges? Um, and it's an awesome group. And it's one I'm really proud to be a part of. How often does that group meet? About every quarter, okay, um, three to four times a year. Okay, great. I also noted in the intro that you identify as non-binary. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about your story, your background. Sure. Um, it's a complex journey. First, I should say 
I know that a lot of people get nervous about, you know, how do I talk to transgender people? How do right. I talk to non-binary people? I was not born knowing how. <laughs> <laughs> I was not born knowing anything. Very, right. very, very few people were, I think. And I didn't know that being transgender, being transsexual was an option. I didn't know what it was. I saw like Maury, I saw Mrs. Doubtfire, you know, right. I saw cross-dressing, yeah. you know, and all those things. And because that is the least quote unquote adult version of what we show on television. And mm -hmm. so that informed my perception of what it was to be transgender, to be gay or lesbian. I think the first time I saw a gay couple was in Friends. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was not introduced to LGBTQ culture by some, via some academic route, <laughs> you know, right. I started on the same base that most everyone else did. So I spent a long time trying to figure out how to be comfortable with my identity. And I, and I shifted through a lot of different sexuality labels and trying to figure out, oh, am I a binary trans man, for example? Am I a lesbian? You know, am I just very butch? I didn't know. And frankly, I didn't know that you could even be transgender until I was in college. Mm -hmm. So I had had feelings all my life about, I wish I could look like this. I wish I could do these things, but not really seeing them as an option. I was sort of limited by what I had been told in, in media, what you can do with your gender. Right. You know, and so much of that is so subtle. It wasn't as if anybody in my life ever sat me down and said, okay, here are the rules for your gender and your body. And this is it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But we internalize that all the time, you know, and even for people who are cisgender, I always say, think about what gender means to you, because frankly, we don't know. We're just kind of guessing a lot of the time. <laughs> and I think what was most surprising to me is that I shifted from a period of trying to be very, very gender conforming, um, trying to be precisely what I thought society wanted me to be and being very unhappy. Mm -hmm to adhering to what I thought was the most trans a person could be. And that didn't work either. <laughs> right. What I found was that I didn't want to go from a restrictive set of gender norms for one gender to another restrictive set of gender norms, which also right. didn't really benefit me. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true for everyone, sure. whether they're transgender or they're not transgender, cisgender, um, gender nonconforming or not. I think that there is a great deal of flexibility within gender that we're not given the liberty to explore. Um, and I think it's really important for everyone's mental health that they think, what is really important to me? For me, transition was a way to alleviate my physical dysphoria. That's what's most important to me as a transgender person. It's not really about my name or my pronouns or how other people see me. Mm -hmm. It's about coming home to your own body. Yeah. And I think we all try to do that via different expressions of ourselves. Sure. It's not as scary and cryptic as I think a lot of people <laughs> think being transgender is. Um, it's really something everybody's figuring out all the time. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that um, folks maybe have some apprehension about is, is the terminology. And, oh, my God, am I going to use the wrong pronoun for this person uh -huh. or, or describe them in a, in a way that doesn't jive with how they feel or how they identify themselves? So what's some advice for folks who maybe have that, uh, that apprehension, that, that reservation about the terminology and, and maybe who are intimidated by that? Sure. How to talk to trans people, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It, you see online videos of transgender people who are angry and screaming at you, right? And it gives people a sense of apprehension and fear. <laughs> there is no perfect way. We are not very volatile. <laughs> Trust me, anything that you can say to a trans person they've probably heard before tone matters a lot more mm -hmm. asking what do you prefer you know what does that mean to you right just like you would if you had you know never met a veteran before mm -hmm. like think of it the same way it's just another dialect and it's not going to be the same in new york city as it is in california and it's not going to be the same in california as it's going to be in the new river valley mm -hmm. and it's not going to be the same in new river valley as it is in a roanoke or richmond right so the culture that develops for trans people is unique to that area. It's unique to the age group. You know, going on GLAD is wonderful. But if you're talking to a group of 60-year-old trans people, the way they talk about their bodies and their identities is going to be really different. 
and not necessarily equatable to the way a group of 16-year-old transgender people talk about themselves. It's the same as if you talk to 60-year-old Republicans and then 16-year-old Republicans. Right. They're going to use very different terminology. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. Is there a resource for folks that that want to learn more about terminology and, and how to appropriately address folks who are, who, are, who are trans or LGBTQ? That's a good question. Um, I think that there are a lot of projects. I'm glad I get a message. I, I didn't, sorry. Glad again is a good website, but I really think at the end of the day, your best policy is just to ask, you know, safe zone has resources on things like that too. Mm -hmm. If you're just curious about like, you know, what's the difference between somebody being transgender and transsexual, right? Like who uses this term most commonly, your best bet is just to talk to trans people around your area and figure out what's appropriate for them. You know, if you know, trans young adults, go sit in on a PFLAG meeting. You know, mm-hmm. PFLAG has chapters in a lot of places, and a lot of them maintain really, really good websites that will give you more information on what's normal for those areas. Um, I would say, too, that don't feel bad if you mess up. It's really okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, we're a lot harder to offend than I think popular culture thinks. Uh-huh. What we really want is to be seen and respected Mm -hmm. as people who are determining our own selves, you know, and I think that that makes it really hard when we live in a society that pulls us in two different ways. Um, I know a lot of people are afraid, you know, if my child is transgender, does that put them in danger? Does Mm -hmm. that put them at risk? Right. Within my job at the Women's Resource Center, I go and, and I present scary information, right? You know, half of all trans people roundabout will experience some form of violence, right? That's a terrifying statistic and it scares parents. They want to keep their kids safe. Mm-hmm. So they say, hey, please don't be transgender. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's not the right way to go about it because being transgender is only a choice in as much as any other truth about you is a choice. Mm-hmm. In as much as your religion is a choice, you know, if you were to deny that sort of a critical part of yourself, you're not going to be happy, right? Right. You need to answer those questions for yourself. So just talking to people, I think for your area, you don't have to do what people in New York do. Mm-hmm. You don't have to arrive at the same conclusions. You don't have to use the same language. People should be able to use what's right for them. And people should be able to answer their own questions of identity. Can you talk about, um, being a part of the LGBTQ community in a rural part of the country, central Appalachia, Southwest Virginia, uh, in the new river Valley. What, what's that like? What are the challenges? What are the, what are the positives? There are some amazing positives with the community here. I think that when people think about gay and trans people, bisexual and lesbian people, you know, what have you, they think about populations in San Francisco, they think about populations in New York City, and you don't see how wonderful PFLAG Floyd can be, mm-hmm. how nice it is to be a part of a rural community that has a different perception of different values, you know, a unique heritage of their own. There's a picture that I love that's in black and white of these coal miners with a big banner that says, you know, lesbians and gays support the mining strike or something like that. Mm. And I think it really speaks to our unique area. It's a part of our history, Mm -hmm. right? We didn't just come from New York city. We didn't just come from Southern California, right? We came from everywhere. And Mm -hmm. these rural pockets can offer really unique opportunities for community that we can't overlook, you know, because that's how real cultural change happens. We appreciate that diversity. We figure out what works. You know, around here in Appalachia, I see more LGBT farming communities than I ever thought existed. Like, I think it's amazing, (laughs) right? Our communities are strong and they're vibrant and you don't have to go to a city Mm -hmm. To find transgender people, gay people, again, like, these communities are here. They have always been here. But at the same time, I've definitely experienced homophobia here. I've experienced homophobia in cities. I've experienced transphobia in those places, too. You know, that's also a force of our society. It's It's not exclusive to areas that turn red on an election map. Right. Right. 
it's something that's everywhere, that's in our society. And I think it's really important for people in rural communities, especially those who are raising transgender or gay kids, to say, it's our family that can make the difference. Mm -hmm. When I come and I give those statistics, when I say, hey, we need to think about the rates of abuse in our communities, you know, as LGBT people. Like, I myself am bisexual as well as a gender, you know, so I don't identify with a spe specific gender. But I see the statistics on bisexual people suffering abuse, and it's hugely concerning, mm -hmm. hugely concerning, no matter their sex assigned at birth, no matter the gender they identify with. It's a huge terrifying problem both for trans people and for bisexual people and for gay people you know mm -hmm. and for straight people yeah. but that's something that we can come together on and say what are the roots of these problems mm -hmm. are we being rejected at home are we receiving unequal services in the medical field are we receiving unequal services in schools is it bullying when we find those problems we can face them head on right and we can know that it's not the fault of the district that we live in Mm -hmm. it's our job to make up that culture. So the challenges of being in a community that um, tends to be more conserv conservative in nature, um, I mean, does that, does that cause more problems or more challenges? I think it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. I think it's, that is really unique to the person. I think that in more conservative communities, you have more difficulty getting legislative change passed. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of the most important legislative change has come down recently on the federal level. Right. And then you have other problems like, is Virginia, for example, a, a conservative state? That's hard to answer. Right. You know, we're right sort of on that line, that, that moderate center mm -hmm. of the, of the thing, that's of the scale. <laughs> right. Right. And then we're also a right to work state. Right. 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 So, I have told people before, I've been not hired for being trans way more than I've been fired for being trans. Mm -hmm. As a transgender person, your name change will go on your resume. Your gender marker will go on your resume. There's a lot we don't have a choice about. And even a well-meaning employer who's totally liberal, right, right? Who, who like is very trans affirming, might look at that incongruous documentation and say, I don't want this person to experience harassment and not hire you. Yeah. Right. Very good intentioned people can perpetuate discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I think that in rural communities, it really comes down to the people, yeah. not the, the, not the legislative power, right. because that's, that's what really matters. Mm -hmm. There are millions of laws on the books, but whether people choose to enforce them or not enforce them, whether people choose to say, this is the way we want to conduct our lives, or this is not the way we want to conduct our lives, that's what determines how we live. Mm -hmm. Legislative change is not enough. Right. Change has to come from the heart. Right. And a lot of very conservative people I've known and have met are wonderful, supportive people. Once you just step over this idea that, oh, we can't be friends, right. you know, or, oh, trans people behave this way. Or other myths about transgender people, like, you know, the bathroom predator myth, right? right. You know, <laughs> which, which causes us a lot of grief. Most transgender people that I know, we just prefer a single stall, gender neutral restroom. Yep. Because even if you're not transgender, if you don't quote unquote look like mm -hmm. the gender on that restroom, you're going to get harassed either way. You might be a cisgender straight woman. And if you happen to have facial hair, you run the risk of getting hurt. Right. right. We all already have single stall gender neutral restrooms in our homes and it works pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the flip on that is that if somebody who is a predator wants to enter a restroom, a sign's not going to stop them. They're just going to do it. Right. They always have. Yeah. You know, transgender people like everybody else, we just want to be safe. Yeah. That's really all there is to it. We want to be safe and we want to be seen as worthy whole people, you know, but unfortunately we do run into those boundaries, like I said before, in the medical field, in terms of, you know, the threat of outing in a relationship, um, sexual violence. Again, if you don't, if you can't access employment, if you can't access capital and your family has rejected you, what is there left for you? Right. If you can't get therapy because all the therapists you meet don't understand transgender people and are saying things that make you constantly justify your existence. Are you going to turn to drugs and alcohol? Right. You know, 
the peop- it's easy to see an us and a them. Mm-hmm. A privileged transgender people who are successful and transgender people who are living on the street or are participating in the sex trade. But the truth is the choices that people make are logical for them in that time. And it's important to generate that kind of empathy and understand that that could have been us. Right. Had our lives been just slightly different, it could be us. Mm-hmm. And that goes for anybody. There have been some, and you, you mentioned this um, earlier, there have been some positive legislative changes. The Supreme Court's decision uh, a week or so ago, um, and then I think July 1st, Virginia um, on the books uh, effectively bans conversion therapy. Yes, that's extremely exciting. So so those are positive moves. I, I um, totally understand and hear what you're saying when you say that legislative change is not enough. Um, but it definitely matters. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like it does. Yeah. <laughs> Every little bit helps, right? Oh, yeah, especially when it comes to things like legislative documents, your driver's license. Yeah. 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 The legislature controls that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They're the only ones who can fix it. Yeah. But but at the, at the end of the day, um, I suppose a lot of what uh, a young person, for example, might uh, might be able to experience in, in transitioning or coming out uh, ultimately comes down to how they're supported at home or not supported. Can you talk yes. about that a little bit? Yeah, for me, um, it was really difficult to come out. And I, I find that that experience is shared quite a bit between age groups of transgender people and of people who are attracted to their own gender, whatever form that takes. But what I will say is that often your parents care about you, your, your friends care about you, your family cares about you, and many of them do want you to be safe. Mm-hmm. And they will learn just like you did. You know, my my parents now are very supportive of me. Have they always been? It's been a rocky road, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that coming out is really hard, but it's a part of living your truth. I did not always get the responses I was hoping for. I did not always get the support that I needed. But now, as an almost 30-year-old, my relationship with my parents is pretty good, and they're affirming. And I've seen them defend me when people are transphobic or homophobic. And that means so much. It's incredibly healing to have somebody in a position of authority affirming you and saying, no, you're not going to talk that way about my child. You're not going to talk that way about my student or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Home rejection accounts for a lot of the homelessness um, for LGBT youth. A lot of transgender people, a lot of gay people, especially young gay men, mm-hmm. end up homeless because their families say, oh, this isn't how I want my child to act. You better sort yourself out. And what they hope is that their kid changes their mind and comes back. But a teenager does not want to do that. Right. Even if that kid doesn't actually end up being trans for the rest of their life, even if they say, no, I think I felt this way for a different reason. That sort of harm pushes children to do desperate things Mm -hmm. and to survive in desperate ways. And when that part of the conversation, that parental rejection part, can't be left out when we talk about LGBT partner abuse, LGBT sexual assault, LGBT substance addiction, LGBT mental health, you know, rejection in those formative years, in the teenage years, can mess with you for life. Sure. And it can make you averse to reaching out to people who you likewise think should support you because the people who we always hope will support us the most, our family, didn't come through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you touched upon uh, something that I wanted to get into a little bit more around um, the behavioral health implications of um, coming out with young people who are transitioning, coming out, um, you know, getting to um, getting to a point that they're um, discovering themselves, for lack of a better term. But uh-huh. we also know from a lot of data and research that they tend to have higher rates of substance use, as you mentioned, and also suicide. Yeah, that is the tragic case. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be very hard. There is a great deal of minority stress that is put on young transgender people 
not only to find their identity, but to then constantly argue and be their own advocates, right? So not only does this young child have to say, hey, I'm a transgender woman, they then have to prove it every day, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge burden to shoulder. Likewise, when that person gets a little bit older and they say, oh, I have depression, you know, I'd like to reach out to a mental health resource. The fact is that transgender rights and civil rights for LGBT people at large is still kind of touch and go, Mm -hmm. right? We're still kind of figuring this out. People's knowledge and service provision right now is unfortunately not always equitable. You know, I have had counselors that build themselves as LGBT friendly therapists um, ask me if I was transgender because of my relationship with my parents. I've been asked, I've been taken for a trans woman because I was wearing blue sandals. Like oh, wow. those are very <laughs> average things yeah. that have happened to a lot of trans people, even somebody as pro therapy and pro mental health as I am, it turned me off of wanting to meet with that counselor, yeah. you know, and that experience is not unique. It becomes really hard to reach out for mental health reasons when you're transgender because you have that additional boundary of people wanting to assume that you have these problems because you're transgender when in fact it's because of the stress you're facing every day Mm -hmm. you know or because of trauma that's happened to you or may still be happening to you it makes accessing healthy safe ways to enter recovery that much harder so what's the answer there emil How, how do we make that better how do we improve that I think cultural competence is a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, What a lot of clinicians find is if one transgender person or one gay person comes to your practice and has a positive experience, you will then see a lot more in very short order because we go home and we tell all our friends. Mm. (laughs) That's sort of how I've always done it. That's how anecdotally I think that a lot of other trans people do it. Um, When we identify a safe resource, we do take advantage of it. I think showing up for us in public venues and saying, hey, for example, we are Planned Parenthood, you know, we're here at your Pride event and we want to tell you we're here for you. Or Mm -hmm. like with us at the Women's Women's Resource Center, us saying, hey, this is our inclusion council. We're getting our information together. Please reach out, you know. And if somebody is discriminated against at your practice or if somebody has an adverse experience, owning up to that and apologizing genuinely can go a long way, you know treat transgender people and gay people just as you would want to be treated. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody, if, if you, if someone came to, if I was a mental health practitioner and somebody came to my practice and I assumed they were transgender and gay and they turned out to be not transgender and straight. And I said something that offended them. I would want to make that right. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. because I made assumptions about their experience that shouldn't have had that sort of bearing on what I, on, on their treatment. Right. It's easy to apologize it's easy to reach back out. Most people will forgive you. That goes for trans people too. Yeah. There seems to be, um, anecdotally speaking, of course, that there seems to be more openness about sexuality um, and not necessarily conforming to the historical expectations of what that might need to look like. Um, But I wonder, uh, from your perspective, do you think that we've, we've gotten better as a society as far as acceptance uh, of folks with different um, gender identification? I think that that's a very complex question because it's very tempting to say, to look at the progress we've made, and we have made progress, and to say, look, we're better now than we ever have been before. Mm -hmm. But that is not necessarily true. There have been aspects of LGBT identity all throughout history, and at times some of them have been accepted and some of them have not. Mm -hmm. You know, at times some of them have been framed in very different ways. There have been cultures where some forms of gender nonconformity and transness were okay and some forms were not. Mm -hmm. I think that it's really important to to, to see history and not to assume we're doing great and rest on our laurels. You know, it's very comparable to civil rights as a whole, you know, mm-hmm. crusade for uh, anti-discrimination for disabled people, um, for gender equality, for racial justice. Yeah. Like, it's not just one line. You know, we've had dips and we've had great successes. Mm-hmm. You know, we've had amazing activists, Bayard Rustin, you know, Harvey Melk. You think about people who have risked their lives to stand up and fight for equality and human sexuality, Alfred Kinsey. 
you know, often we forget about people like that, the Storm DeLarvery, you know, it, when we just talk about selective events, um, a lot of, especially very young LGBT people um, hear about Stonewall, which is great, but the crusade for civil rights didn't start with Stonewall right. and it didn't even start with America. Mm-hmm. And knowing where we came from is critical to knowing where we need to go. Along the same lines, the current events that are happening now with social justice, um, racial tensions, any parallels to draw from that with, with, um, the LGBTQ community? Are there, are there parallels? Are there, are there ways that, um, what is happening with, um, the black community carries over into the LGBTQ population? Yes. Absolutely. Can you talk about um, that some? The struggle for civil rights, there's no one part that can be pulled out and, and said to be just what I'm focusing on. Mm-hmm. You know, when I'm doing activism to support my LGBT brothers and sisters and siblings, you know, I also necessarily need to be doing work for people who are disabled and people who are black and people who are immigrants and people who, you know, and it goes on because those experiences are tied up with what it is to be human, mm-hmm. you know, where one person is in chains, I am not free. Right. You know, that is extremely true. When you look at the disproportionate killing of black trans people, especially black trans women, you know, you can't talk about that without acknowledging the economic burden and housing discrimination and mm-hmm. things like that, that come with blackness, you know, the, the issues in policing, right. That come with transness and blackness, all that works together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a com it's a series of moving parts. And to just say, I'm only going to focus on this one part of justice isn't really justice. Um, it is very important for any activist to look at other struggles. And just like when you study history, you might have a focus say in, um, 20th century Prussia or whatever, but, you can't take that piece out from what was happening in the world as a whole. Right. It's all together. I like the way you put that. You've talked quite a bit about the domestic violence, the pre- prevalence of that toward um, the trans population, folks who are LGBT. Can you just talk a little bit more about why we see so much of that? Well, there are a couple of different takes here. Um, mm-hmm. And I can break this down in two different ways when we talk about offender victim dynamics. Mm-hmm. One is in relationships where both the partners are trans, which are fairly common. Um, you often see that people share a small closed social circle where the perpetrator of that violence is holding the majority of the social power. Mm-hmm. So that puts the victim in a really hard position to leave. You're not just leaving your perpetrator. You're leaving all your friends. You're leaving that social support system. You're leaving the people who tell you which clinics are safe to go to. You're leaving the people who help you pay the rent because, you know, you're not getting paid enough because you can't get a good enough job because you're not getting hired because you're trans, right? Mm -hmm. Like things like that are really, really common and also make it really, really dangerous to have that kind of small closed group unity. It's a lot like what you might observe in Amish communities and things like that, where Mm -hmm. you have a small insular social group it makes it that much harder to leave Mm -hmm. in relationships where just one of the partners is trans, whether that partner is the perpetrator of violence or not, you have problems around outing. You have problems around social privilege where one partner may have greater access to, um, again, like medicine, insurance, things like that. than the other one, they may have access to transportation. They may have the housing, you know, all of those things, again, economic justice, racial justice, they all pour into the problems that we see in terms of transsexual and relationship abuse. I I think isolation is a huge risk factor for all kinds of survivors, Mm -hmm. you you know, and that's true whether you're an immigrant or you're transgender or you just live in rural Appalachia where your closest neighbor is three miles away and you don't have a car. Right. Yeah. And maybe even more so now with the uh, pandemic, right? Exactly. Right. There have been a lot of people who were like, well, can I go to a shelter Mm -hmm. if I'm experiencing abuse? If there's a pandemic, does that mean I'm going to get sick? You know, and I I would say, well, probably less than going for groceries. (laughs) We hope. (laughs) Yeah. Good point. Good point. But again, people with compromised health, you know, like that's another boundary. 
if somebody is dependent on their partner's insurance to get their hormone replacement therapy Mm -hmm. or to cover surgery, that's going to be harder to leave. Yeah, great point. You've been very generous with your time, Emil. Before we go, I wanted to see if you maybe had some parting words of wisdom to share with our listeners. Absolutely. Um, Well, if I can quote Galaxy Quest, which is like one of my favorite movies of all time, Sure. I would say, never give up, never surrender. And right. I think that's a funny way of saying something that's very true. Um, it's something that I've held on to. That was one of my favorite movies of my childhood, because yeah. I think that it's so hard. It's so easy, especially today, when we see pandemics, you know, mm-hmm. and police violence and things like that, people struggling and people feeling alone. It's easy to just sit back and say, I just want all this to be over. And when you're a young trans teenager, it's easy to say, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to figure this out. I, I don't know. I can't prove who I am to myself. So why should I try? Don't give up. You'll get there. It like takes it. time and it takes learning. I like it. Great advice. One more question, uh, Neil, that just came to mind that I wanted to throw out there. For folks who don't identify as LGBT or uh, trans uh what what are some of the ways that we can be supportive? Well, we definitely need our allies. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest ways that you can be supportive to folks in the LGBT community is to talk to other people who aren't about us. Like when you hear relatives at the dinner table saying things that are homophobic or transphobic, say, hey, you know, I don't believe that, mm-hmm. you know, and explain to them why because they'll listen to you in a way that we probably won't get listened to, or that there might be additional boundaries to us explaining. You know, a lot of LGBT organizations are happy to have allies come to their meetings. We're ecstatic to have you there because you guys are really important voices Mm -hmm. and you wield the same type of power for change that everyone else does. Emil, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honor to have you here on the show and, uh, I just really appreciate the conversation and, uh, Hope that we can maybe do this again sometime soon. Absolutely, Mike. I appreciate that. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Dissect and Connect is sponsored by Teen Connections, a leadership program through Planned Parenthood South Atlantic that empowers youth with the facts about sexual health and the skills to build stronger, healthier relationships. It's free, totally virtual, and you can earn $100 when you graduate as a Teen Connections peer educator in your community. Join a Teen Connections program from home today. For more information, be sure to check out the show notes from today's episode. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Dissect and Connect podcast. To learn more about Montgomery County Prevention Partners, our New River Valley Community Services, be sure to check us out on Facebook or visit nrvcs.org podcast.